Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show. Over 250,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Check out the podcast's homepage at www.therobburgessshow.com. Check out my website at www.thisburgess.com. Welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 38th episode, our guest is Robert Cohen. Robert Cohen is a community photojournalist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He can be found in schools, at parades, in restaurants, and on baseball fields, or wherever a story about St. Louis and its people asks to be told. Cohen's images of unrest following the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri were part of the 2015 Pulitzer Prize in Breaking News Photography awarded to the photo staff. He's been a finalist for the prize twice. In 2010 for feature photography for a body of work about suburban homelessness and in 2009 for breaking news reporting as a member of the team covering a city hall shooting. He has been named eight times as Regional Photographer of the Year by the National Press Photographers Association and is a member of the Scripps Howard Editorial Hall of Fame. A graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, he began his career at the tiny Sun Tattler newspaper in Hollywood, Florida, now home to a Holiday Inn. I had the honor of meeting Robert on Saturday at the Indianapolis Marriott North during the 50th annual Hoosier State Press Association Newsroom Seminar and Better Newspaper Contest Awards Luncheon. I attended his presentation, Capturing Moments in Time When Time and Moments Are More Fleeting Than Ever, which was described this way. Today's visual journalists are pulled in so many different directions that our core mission of reaching readers with captured moments of time is eroding. Robert will talk about wearing too many hats and the pitfalls of navigating that new reality. One final note, since Robert is a photographer, most of what we'll be talking about will involve his amazing photographs. I've provided links to these on the show's website under this episode if you want to see what we're talking about. And now on to the show. Hi, it's Robert. Hey, it's Rob. How are you? Good, how are you? Doing okay. Good, good. Thanks for taking the time here. I appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. No, I've been playing with the museum app this morning, just kind of kind of interesting. What, what is that? They have a new, uh, the museum in D.C. has a has a new app for oh. a, a Pulitzer exhibit, and it's kind of interesting because you can theoretically explore their Pulitzer galleries and point your phone at images and see if there's more to learn on their app. And, oh. Like, and interviews with photographers and stuff. But the interesting thing is, uh, I just realized you can do it anywhere. So you can, like... Pull up pictures on a screen of, you know, Pulitzer winners and look and see if there's any more to learn. It's kind of cool. That is cool. <laughs> That's kind of like, uh, what is that, Shazam for music? For when you put it. Yeah. Yeah. So, cool. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, what can I do for you? Um, so, yeah. So, I was just wondering uh, how you first got interested in photography as a kid. Oh, okay. Um, I actually, I, I started photography at the high school newspaper and uh i was called the irish eyes and so i joined the newspaper and um and then uh, started getting a a job at a local camera store and just learned more Mm -hmm. and this was back in the days of of film uh for for the younger listeners i guess (laughs) yeah yeah, it was was back in the days of film and Mm -hmm. the uh 24 hour uh, photo processing lab where you could drop your pictures off one day or drop your film off one day and pick it up the next morning. Uh, that was a big deal back then. But, mm-hmm. uh, but I was really fortunate because the, the man who ran the photo lab at the camera store 
also happened to be the staff photographer for the New, York, New Orleans Saints football team. Oh. And, uh, and so on the weekends, if they had home games, he'd let me come with him and, you know, help him carry his gear and also, you know, gave me the opportunity to shoot pictures on the field. And that was, you know, that was kind of fun. And that was some of my first uh, tastes of, of actual uh, folks out working, you know, making money with photographs. Mm-hmm. Did you learn how to uh, develop your own photographs at any point when you were doing that? Yeah, absolutely. I first learned about that when I was at the uh, high school newspaper. Okay. And uh, you know, we would develop black and white film back in the uh, the chemistry classroom. They had uh, a dark room off to the side, and that's where that's where we used to develop our film and make prints, and uh, mm-hmm. then later on learned a little bit more about color. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's uh, it's kind of amazing if you only started shooting on digital that you don't realize how you know important each shot on on film was back then. Like it's like you better get closer to like what you're trying for. I feel like now it's like you can take a thousand pictures and maybe something will be good in the in the yeah. batch there. So yeah, and it also you know it also taught you about you know. Well, making a successful print in a dark room mm-hmm. is, you know, so much different than toning on a screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, the, the skills you learn in the dark room, even though, you know, you don't use those specific skills anymore, but you, you use the idea of, of, you know, making an image, you know, look the way it needs to look, whether it's color correcting or, or you know, dodging and burning mm-hmm. in, in the image, making some things lighter, some things darker. Um, so yeah, those, those skills translate. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you still shoot on film nowadays or is it just strictly digital for you now? It's strictly digital. Um, the last film I shot was a story probably in 2010 about, uh, it was kind of a first person story about the last roll of Kodachrome I had in my freezer. And, uh, <laughs> I took it out to the Sedalia, to the uh, Missouri State Fair in Sedalia, and um, shot the last roll I had there, and then uh, then drove that roll of film about 300 miles away to Parsons, Kansas, which was the very last um, processing lab for Kodachrome film in the United States. Oh wow! And had my last roll developed there, and then yeah, did a story about it. It was it was kind of a fun experience. Oh, that's really cool. Um, so after you were uh, doing that for the high school paper, uh, what led you to your your first kind of professional uh, after that? Yeah, after after high school, I went to the University of Texas, majored in journalism and specifically photojournalism, and uh, so worked for the student newspaper at school for three years, and during that time, tried to get internships at um, at newspapers across the country in the summer, and you know, kind of a goal for all of us. And um, I, I did two internships, and um, then after school, I um, did one more extended internship, and that internship led to my first job in a small paper in Hollywood, Florida, called the Sun Tatler, uh, about a twenty-two thousand circulation newspaper that. Is long gone now, and it's uh, it's uh, now the building actually is a Holiday Inn. Oh wow! Okay, the building was converted. Actually, I'm the, I assume the building was torn down. Uh-huh. A Holiday Inn was built in this place. Mm-hmm. And uh, what led you from there to the Post Dispatch? Uh, there was a couple other places after after Hollywood. I I spent some time at the Florida Times Union in Jacksonville. And then went to the Commercial Appeal, the city newspaper in Memphis, Tennessee, and I worked there for ten years. Hmm. And um, so now I've been in St. Louis for seventeen years. So oh, wow. my, yeah, so the bulk of my work is has been done in St. Louis and Memphis. Right, right. Um, now, when you're out on assignment, uh, what's your general uh, rig as far as equipment? Do you use two camera bodies, one with different uh, size lenses, or or how does what's your usual? Yeah, my that's that's exactly what I do. I okay. carry two bo- Yeah, I carry two bodies. I have you know one lens on each. Uh, one is a kind of a 
um, medium telephoto zoom, a 70 to 200, and then the other one is a wide angle zoom, like a 24 to 70. So, you know, I pretty much cover everything from 24 to 200, and then, and then in the car, I have, you know, additional lenses as needed, but I, I like to travel as light as I can. Um, for many stories, I'll just travel with one body, one lens. If I know if I'm going to be inside and probably not going to need a longer zoom, I'll, I'll travel with one camera whenever possible. Right, right. Uh, do you have a brand preference as far as like what brand of equipment you use mostly? or? You know, we use uh, Canon cameras here at the Post Dispatch. Um, you know, before I came to St. Louis, I used Nikon pretty much my whole life. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, it's, it's whatever the whatever the newspaper uses, and, yeah. and that's usually the, you know that's usually decided by you know we have we have what's called a pool closet, and that's where we keep our longer lenses for football and things like that. And so, you know, every newspaper has a pool closet of some sort for longer, more expensive lenses, and whatever that brand is is the brand camera. Right, right. Um, for your personal use, though, I'm sure you have your personal rig. Do you have a per- personal preference about what you use when you when you have a choice? I, I really don't have much personal. Gear okay. At all. Um, I have, you know, I have a small Canon point and shoot, um, but uh, that's about it. Wow. That's about it. You know, if, I, if I'm going on vacation. Um, I'm probably I'm probably traveling with some sort of a point and shoot. Hmm. Um, but if you know, depending on what it is, I, I don't you know. I carry I carry a lot of gear around on a daily basis, and I, I don't you know if I'm traveling on vacation, <laughs> I, I don't I do not want to travel heavy. You know? Yeah, I guess I guess I understand yeah. that for sure. Yeah. Um, now, I, I, one thing that's interesting to me is how. Uh, high quality cell phone cameras have gotten. Uh, of course, it's not with an external lens or whatever, but I feel like the megapixels at least keep keep going up and up. Um, you know, I, I feel like people are able to take better pictures on those, but it still doesn't mean you know what a good picture looks like. So, uh, do you feel? I mean, I don't know, threatened or not threatened, but you know, in any way, kind of shoved out because people can take such high quality photos with their cell phones. Although that doesn't mean you know what a good picture is. So. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's great that you know. We have we have high quality cameras in our pocket now. I think that's I think that's wonderful. Um, you know, that if anything, it, it it shows us. You know, it gives us the ability as as you know, jokey citizen to to take pictures of something they stumble across. I mean, we're we're certainly seeing more video footage and news events that we wouldn't normally see. We see you know more still pictures of breaking news that we would normally see. Um, so that's, I think that's advantageous to everybody. I mean, mm-hmm. more, more information out the public arena is what you want. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I would never, yeah, I would never feel threatened by right. that. I think, I think that's great. Right, right. Um, so I first became aware of your work during the, the Ferguson riots, uh, but I thought it was really interesting in your presentation you did at the uh, conference here that uh, you had been at a uh, mannequin uh, a sale, uh, to, which just seems like a, such a contrast between, uh, you know, deadly serious and, and kind of funny. And those were great pictures, too. I especially like the one you showed of the two mannequins in the back seat uh, while they're taking them home. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, that day and kind of going from one situation to the next yeah yeah it was it was um, police shootings in st louis are not that unusual they certainly don't happen every day they don't happen every week but you know for for us to have and sir shoot and kill somebody a suspect or whatever or or an innocent person um it's something we see probably you know probably once every couple months and so it's not incredibly unusual and um so when this happened on Sunday, I, I was not working that day. And um, I'm sorry, I think it happened on Saturday now that I'm thinking. Um, I was not working that day. I was I was off, and we had a skeleton crew working, and we actually got a late start on the story. We just we didn't know about it, and we only had one photographer working that day. And um, so that photographer eventually got out there, and then we added another photographer that evening. But then the next morning, which would have been Sunday morning, um, 
I had two other assignments first to do in the morning, and I was still planning to go out to Ferguson and, and kind of see what was going on the, the next day. And, and, um, and as, as a newspaper, it took us just a little bit to realize, you know, how serious this was becoming and, and how, how much it was escalating. Um, so I ended up shooting a portrait of a student getting ready to go to college. Uh, for a story we were doing, and then I went to the mannequin sale after that, and then uh, by about lunchtime, I guess, was the first time I got out to Ferguson. Um, mm-hmm. so it was, um, yeah, it was an interesting day. It was a day that went deep into the night. I I got off work at kind of a normal scheduled evening time, like six o'clock or so, and mm-hmm. and uh, went home and followed, kept following our Twitter feed and seeing what was going and. And uh, when the first looting happened, mm-hmm. uh, I went back out to the scene with uh, fellow photographer David Carson and uh, spent most of the night out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there was another amazing kind of two photo uh, thing that you showed at the, the the conference where it was uh, was it a July Fourth parade? Was that the first one? And then uh, the same exact street. How 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 many days was it between those two shots? Of, uh... yeah, actually, yeah, actually, I was, I was working kind of backwards. Um, so oh, okay. That, so the the initial that, that the first picture uh-huh. of officers in the street in Ferguson uh-huh. was. Um, was probably about three days or so, uh, two days or yeah, probably two days after the unrest started, uh-huh. um, and then the July Fourth parade was actually the following July. Oh, okay, so, I see. Um, yeah, I showed them in reverse. Oh, okay. Show, yeah, but the intent was to kind of show how anywhere, any small town in the United States could become right. Uh, could become a Ferguson and sure. the drop of a hat. I mean, there was nothing, nothing really special in Ferguson uh, that that led to this. It could have happened really anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's probably what uh, made it resonate so much for a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, Yeah. But, uh, so I know that the police were cracking down on the press, uh, even arresting, you know, dozens of journalists over the course of the unrest there. Um, Did you fear for your safety at any time from either the police or the public while you were out there? On, on, I mean, on some nights, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I had I had much more problems in terms of uh, of working from. You know, I, I got more more problems from the police than I certainly did from the protesters. Mm. Uh, one thing we were very fortunate in the first few days of the unrest, we were you know we were able to set a pretty good tone with the protesters, and we were trusted to, uh, you know, to be telling as complete a story as we could. And and they, you know, for the most part, they appreciated us being out there, and, and uh, you know, they certainly... They certainly came to some photographer's aid on on occasion, um, myself included, of course. Uh-huh. Uh, police were a little bit different. Uh, police were, in the early days... Um, Certainly, trying to control movement of everybody, especially the media. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they they in the early days they set up a you know, media zone to be in, which was in the parking lot of um, of, a, of a business. And uh, after a day or so of that, the, the the media safe zone, the media work zone, whatever you call it. Uh, was tear gassed by the police mm. one evening, and so that was that was the end of the the media zone. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Um, do you think it was more that they were trying to uh, stop your reporting, or was it just that they kind of weren't over their head as far as they didn't anticipate this happening, and they were kind of out of their depth, and they kind of just were throwing the you know caution to the wind or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't. I never did feel that they were trying to stop reporting. Uh, I definitely felt that they were trying to stop movement. Okay. Uh, they were trying to tell us where we could be, where we could not be, and um, that's where pretty much they overstepped their bounds. But again, it's not. They were not just trying to do that to the media. They mm-hmm. were trying to do that to everybody. Right. Right. Uh, 
and there was something at one point too where you had to keep you couldn't stop right if you stopped moving then then you would be arrested it was like if you right. continued to move even ever how slowly it, you could not be arrested i guess yes it was the ever ineffective five second rule oh, yes. and you couldn't stand anywhere for more than five seconds at a time you had to keep moving and and that you know that rule that law whatever they call it was quashed by the courts pretty quickly yeah, yeah and, I, I um, don't remember that part of the first amendment but okay <laughs> yeah, within, within days uh that order was gone yeah yeah um you know that the, there was a journalist uh, scott olson yeah. photographer with getty images was arrested over that exact um rule and you know he was he was told to keep moving and he said absolutely not my first amendment rights to be here i'm not you know, I'm not leaving and was mm-hmm. arrested and, and his arrest was pretty high profile because it was one of the very, very early arrests and it was specifically against the five second rule and so that I think that that helped mm-hmm. eliminate that. Yeah, and he was a former Marine too, right? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Um now, you talked a little bit about this at the conference, and, of course, one of the most famous photos uh, from that uh, was the photo of Ed Crawford throwing the uh, tear gas back at the police with the, uh, and I'm sorry, what was the brand of chips on the other hand? It was uh, Red Hot Riplets, is the, uh, is, is the uh, type of chip. Yeah. St. Louis, yeah, the St. Louis made, made chip. Yeah, that's uh, that was another funny contrast. It's like he'd just been eating chips, and now he's now he's doing this. It's like snack in one hand, you know, <laughs> the thing in yeah, the other. Yeah, it, it was kind of funny. It was, uh, you know, Ed and I got to know each other pretty well, and, um, you know, my, weeks and months later, not certainly not at that time, uh-huh. but, um, you know, everybody was asking him, you know, where where did the chips come from? He was just, <laughs> he was out there. That was his first night out at the protest, uh-huh. and, uh he saw some guy with uh, with his bag of chips and and asked if he could have a few and, and the guy the guy said hey take the whole bag I got plenty and so uh, and so that's how he was you know, that's how he was walking around. right right um, and there's a for people that haven't heard it yet uh, there's a great episode of the podcast Criminal where both of you guys are on there talking about that photo and kind of the aftermath here that people should definitely listen to um, but he uh, I guess was was he arrested that night I assume and then what well, charged yeah, he, with something yeah uh, it's kind of interesting because I didn't I never did see him get arrested uh-huh. after I shot the photograph I was really trying to make deadline I was trying to get the picture back um, and and uh, you know picture was shot right after midnight and we had extended our deadlines at the newspaper to try to get as fresh you know the fresh most fresh coverage we could get into the paper that had everybody's story step the next day and um, so I, I pretty much ran right after I shot that picture to transmit that back to the newspaper and what I didn't see and I didn't actually know this for weeks I, I didn't know he was arrested but mm. uh, yeah he tried to get out of the area after throwing the canister back toward the police lines mm-hmm. and uh, got into a friend's car and and uh, the police were chasing him and they actually you know they broke the glass of the of the window and pretty much pulled him out of the car mm. and arrested him yeah. okay yeah, I mean, a pretty recognizable uh, person with the American flag T-shirt and the the dreads. So just not a lot of <laughs> some pretty identifying features there, I'm sure. Yeah, um, and it was all pretty pretty close quarters. Oh, okay. Close quarters. It wasn't uh, anything terribly far away. Sure, sure. And then you said when you had tweeted that out initially, there was some confusion because people had thought maybe that was a Molotov cocktail instead of him throwing the the gas canister back, right? Yeah, one of the one of the dangers of rapid fire tweets is sometimes they're not. <laughs> completely thought out and in context and uh-huh. I didn't do a great job with that tweet uh, okay. the boss tweeted it out also and did a much better job than I did. <laughs> he actually described the action that you know I forget exactly how his read but he basically said you know wow and picks up a gas container and uh-huh. goes back. Um, whereas mine was much more along the lines of uh, uh, you know the police uh, tear gas protesters for the third night in a row or something mm. like that. I'm not, I wasn't specific enough. Right. 
Um, now, when you took that photo, uh, you said you had tweeted it out that night. So you obviously knew it was at least a, a good photo. Did you know that that was going to be like an iconic photo, though? Because I, I feel like that, uh, it, when I think of photos that you guys took from the Ferguson protest, that one definitely stands out for me. And it's like, uh, do you know when you're taking something like that, how, how you know, far-reaching it's gonna, that impact is going to be? Absolutely not. Not not a clue. Um, you know, when I when I sent the picture, or when I when I photographed it, when I made the photograph, I uh, and I've told other people this. I, I've never I never saw the American flag shirt. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I never saw the chips. Um, I didn't see any of that until I was actually you know back in my car. I was just you know, mm-hmm. trying to get it in focus and and trying to get a few you know frames off. And and it wasn't you know it wasn't wasn't very close to me, you know, the, the, the picture itself is somewhat cropped. And um, so, yeah, it wasn't until I got back to my car and actually started looking at the features, I saw the flag. I, said, I mean, that was obviously the big wow, because I didn't, certainly didn't see it while I was shooting it. Sure. And, um, and so, yeah, you know, you, you get the picture back, you know, it's, uh, you know, my idea to get the picture back quickly not was was not because I thought the image was special. It was more about we had not had any violence that night. Everything had been relatively quiet, and mm-hmm. we were hoping to put the paper to bed with the ability to say that you know peace on the third night, mm-hmm. and the peace was broken. And so that was my impetus to, to get the picture back quickly because mm-hmm. now we had a new storyline. Um, so no, I mean, I, but when I looked at it, you know. They got the flag. The chips is kind of comical in some strange way, <laughs> and um, and so yeah, I, I thought it was definitely one of the nicer pictures I'd shot so far mm-hmm. in, in the three days. But I certainly didn't realize it was going to take off the way it did. I, mm-hmm. You know, I try. I, I I tweeted it out probably. One thirty or so, and uh, went home, went to bed, you know, got the kids up for school, and, uh, and really didn't look at my Twitter feed again until after I dropped them off at school the next day. Mm-hmm. And then it was just, right. it was just nuts. It was just yeah. incredible. And I told people, yeah, you know, I had a, I had a somewhat active Twitter account, but nothing, nothing crazy. I was on it regularly, but not on that much. I probably had six hundred followers or so, and. And just the next morning, you know, sight unseen, I've got over 8,000 followers and everybody's talking about this picture. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my. (laughs) At that point, it's like, okay, this is is resonating with a lot of people. Oh, yeah. And um, so it kind of, you know, you're still still working. You're still covering the story at hand, but but it's certainly becoming a lot more – certainly taking up a lot more of my time every day. (laughs) Definitely. Well, I mean, I think that speaks to the power of, you know, good photography that, you know, one image can sum up, you know, so much in in one place. And you're kind of talking about how you made that picture kind of reminded me of, uh, what's the name of the guy that took the Iwo Jima flag raising photo? Um, Uh, Joe Rosenthal. Yeah, Joe Rosenthal. I I read an interview with him once where he was just like, yeah, I just turned around and, no, they're doing it. So I click, you know, it's like, (laughs) that's the and there, there's the most famous photo he'll ever take, and it was just, you know, oops, boom, there you go. And it's, like, just amazing to me that, you know, photography can, can do that. It's just this one millisecond in time, and, you know, it can represent so much for so many people, you know, so. Right, right, and that's, you know, kind of similar to where it, you know, to the way it happened with me. Oh, yeah. You know, I, interesting. <laughs> For sure. Um, now that started getting reproduced all over, um, and you showed a photo of uh, how many days after that was it? Was it Mike Brown Senior that had the shirt with the with your photo on it? Oh no, no, it wasn't Brown Senior. It was just somebody. Just so, so, somebody. You know, I'm back at the memorial, and I'm just we're we're. I think it was the I think it was like two days after, and but not quite two full days since I shot the thing first thing in the morning. Um, and I'm just at the memorial and just kind of seeing what's going on because, you know, it was a gathering spot. It was a place people went, and and uh, and I see this guy, and he just has he has the picture on his <laughs> on his chest, on his shirt. Uh, I don't believe, I'm trying to remember if there's any writing along the lines or if it was just the photograph, but, mm-hmm. yeah, there's the photograph. And then within another day or so, you start seeing – 
these t-shirts just sold on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, in some ways, uh, West Florissant Avenue, which was kind of the main protest zone, there were there were two big protest zones. One was at the police station, and one was on West Florissant Avenue. Uh-huh. And West Florissant Avenue was starting to become a little bit more of a commerce zone as well as a protest zone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people would be out there selling hot dogs. The ice cream man would go by, and uh, the entrepreneurs and were out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and t shirts started popping up and. And for, you know, a time, most of them involved that image in one way or another. Mm. Um, some were just straight image ripoffs, and others were, uh, you know, artist renderings. What was pretty interesting about this is so many people had this, uh, this need to draw this image. Mm. And, um, so some of that, you know, some of that artwork appeared on t-shirts, uh, with quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so we started seeing it quite a bit on the streets, uh, started seeing people selling them online, and, and so, you know, it's still our image, and mm-hmm. it still has copyright protection, and we, we kept our corporate lawyers busy for <laughs> quite a while. Um, but at a certain point, I mean, it kind of sounds like you guys had to throw in the towel on a lot of that just because it was getting around so much. So they went pretty hot and heavy at the beginning, but, you know, I, I assume it by, by the end of it, it's like, uh, just, there's too many, <laughs> too many, uh, bootleg yeah. versions here. So yeah, I am sure we didn't see everything, Yeah, but we did, we were really aggressive in early on mm-hmm. with any commercial, anything we saw commercial online, mm. we had letters from lawyers sent to those folks. Okay. You know, and and they were um you know I think I think every letter we sent the people stopped selling it because they disappeared. <laughs> right. Uh, now it's possible they showed up somewhere else, but yeah. You know, anything we saw we we definitely had them mm-hmm. get a letter and it usually stopped, but yes, I'm sure there's lots of stuff out there still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, and, and also, uh, it, you know, Ed Crawford seemed pretty, from that criminal episode, I heard, he, you know, it's it, it kind of contrary to what I would think. He's, he's actually pretty thrilled that you got this image, even though it shows him, you know, basically, you know, committing the thing that would, you know, he'd be charged with a crime with. So it's almost like the, you know, the popularity of this photo kind of influenced how he felt maybe about, I don't want to speak for him, but it seems like maybe if, you know, this wasn't a worldwide image and it was just a photo of somebody doing something that maybe they shouldn't, you know, it was, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's not going to be maybe well was received, but now it's like an icon. So it's like maybe <laughs> feeling better about it. So yeah, he, he certainly got a lot of attention. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm certain, you know, I'm certain he did not want the court case also, but mm-hmm. he certainly got a lot of attention. Oh yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't speak for him either, but sure. But that, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, listen to the criminal episode. Yeah, you should. Yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, just from the things I know about Ed, it, you know, Ed's a pretty cool guy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we we haven't seen each other for a while, but you know, for a time we get together every so often, and, uh, grab a bite here and there, and. Just, just a good guy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so your uh, photos and and also the papers uh, were submitted for the Pulitzer. Um, now, did you know that those were being submitted for the Pulitzer once once they did that? Yeah, we we were, um, you know, we worked. We, we realized, you know, this is a this is one of the most important stories in the U.S. that year, and we realized. We made some pretty significant images, and, and so um, one of my uh, colleagues, David Carson, another photographer, and our director of photography, Lyndon Steele. So the three of us worked on an edit um, over the course of weeks. You know, kind of playing with you know which which group of photographs worked the best together to tell the story as strongly as we could tell it, and. Um, Made a lot of changes and and left some great stuff on the cutting room floor from um, several of our photographers and and eventually came up with uh, this group of nineteen. Mm-hmm. The Pulitzers on their their uh, qualifications you can you can order you can enter twenty or less as a group. Mm-hmm. So our number was nineteen. 
Right. Well, I'm sure just based on the all the images you guys took that I remember from that time, it was probably pretty hard narrowing it down just to that many because I just there was just so many great photos from that you guys took. Uh, There's another one that really struck me where uh, tear gas was going in someone's eyes and they were pouring milk to try to alleviate right. the burning. That was really striking. Just the right. color of the the milk and you know everything happening. So, um, but yeah, that was a really amazing set of photos. Now, are all those photos available? I think I saw a slideshow um, of those somewhere. Is that are those all of the ones that you had submitted uh, online? Yeah, there is a yeah there is a gallery online. Okay. On our site, and yeah, it is the nineteen photographs. Okay. Um, you can certainly you can also see them at uh, Pulitzer dot org. Okay. On their site, you can pick out you know different years and look at the winning entries of whatever was whatever won. Right, right. Now, w- when you found out that you had won, uh, that was probably a pretty pretty great day, I have to imagine. <laughs> so. It was uh, actually it was a pretty painful day. Oh, really? It was you know there were, for a lot of us there was you know we we knew when these decisions were coming down. You know we knew when the announcement was going to be. Uh-huh. Uh, we knew that we would be in the newsroom watching it together to see you know if something happened or not uh we had uh you know our our newsroom staff had been nominated in several categories right. several en- several different entries um and um so we were we made a point where a few of us got together for lunch that day i believe it was like a 2 p.m announcement and so we went to lunch and we just you know kind of talked about things and you know no matter what happens it was you know it was pretty special year and uh and so it was it was tough i mean but when we finally got the announcement and we had been passed on for a few other awards and we were luckily a finalist in editorial writing and um but breaking news photography that category is the second to last category in the journalism awards so we've already been through i believe 14 of the 16 um divisions and mm-hmm. And as a newspaper, we had come up empty. And, oh wow! Uh, this was our last. This was our last chance. So, uh, you know, when I believe our our reporter Tim O'Neill, who actually wrote the story about us winning, um, something to the effect of, you know, when when the when the director announced uh, to the St. Louis Post Dispatch that you know they won breaking news photography, mm-hmm. he said the only words that were actually heard was. St. Louis, and the room just erupted. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, but at the same t- you know, but you're looking back at it, you know, we never lose sight that this was a story that, that you know, really caused great division and great mm-hmm. pain to our city. And, right. You know, it all started with an 18-year-old young man you know, dead in the street. Yeah. And no matter what the circumstances were, whether, you know, whether some people feel it was justified, some people feel it was absolutely not justified, uh, it doesn't change and he doesn't come back to life. Yeah. And, uh, so for us, it's, uh, you know, it is a great honor to win a Pulitzer Prize. And, mm-hmm. and uh, but you kind of hope that it doesn't come from, you know, those kind of situations. Sure. But, you know, generally the breaking news culture prize are not, do not go to happy stories. No. Yeah, breaking news, something good happened. Um, that's kind of a good thing. Yeah. For sure. Well, yeah, that's that's good that you don't lose sight of that. And I feel like a lot of times when I've I've judged other states' uh, contests before, and it's it's like when I do judge like things like the breaking news, it's almost like which of the situations is the the worst one. Almost, it's like which one is like the the one that is like the worst situation that somebody could report on. And if you did it well, then it's almost like well, I can't not give the award to the one that did you know the work on the on the hardest one. You know, so I almost feel like the situation kind of sometimes influences that more than anything you know what i mean so. yeah yeah i mean our, our, i think our boss said it said it best for us that he you know he said that the award you know while we don't necessarily you know celebrate the award in a in a happy way so much mm-hmm. it validates our coverage and you know, yeah. validation is probably the best word and sure you know it was it was a very strong very strong coverage from a very serious story mm-hmm. and um 
you know, to get to get a Pulitzer honor, you know, validates that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Now, one of the other um, images that you showed at the conference here uh, kind of was in a similar vein to that. Uh, it was the uh, blood being washed down the street from the officer that had been shot, and that was a pretty striking image. That I remember when that was first published too. Um, and there was you said some kind of you know uh, discussion in the newsroom as to whether even to publish that photo. Is that right? Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was. A, it was a tough discussion. I was. Happily, not part of the tough discussion. Uh -huh. You know, when 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 my pictures specifically are discussed, of you know, should we go down this road or not? I think it's I think it's good for other people besides the photographer to to be making those decisions. We're mm -hmm. just a little bit too close to it, but um, it was uh, yeah, it was a tough picture to shoot, mm -hmm. and obviously it was a horrific day in the city. Yeah, um, but. I think, you know, looking back and, and looking forward, I mean, I think it's important to show, you know, what these officers do and how something so simple as a domestic disturbance of somebody banging on a door uh, can end, you know, this way in the, the death mm -hmm. of a police officer. And um, and also it's it's, you know, people... You know, feel that violent crime only happens in the city and in certain parts of the city, and and this was a very suburban thing that happened, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was important for me, you know, to show a little bit of that environment and and show that this really could this could happen anywhere, mm -hmm. and um, so uh, they, you know, they they finally, yeah, you know, I know, I know, my boss was pushing to run it on the front page, and. Other editors felt differently, and and in the end, they thought that they the best place would be inside the paper where the story mm -hmm. jumped. And but but at the same time, you know, play it prominently and play it in color. Mm -hmm. and so I was glad that uh, you know I, I think where it landed and the fact that they were willing to run it in color and run it big, I think that was probably the best answer to all of it. Right, right. And the, the kind of the blood is an interesting element there because I know when we, the papers I've worked at, the discussion is always, well, if there's somebody that's been shot or something, we don't want to show any, you know, their face or, because if, if they die later, then we've shown somebody that died, you know, so it's, that, that's more of like the, on the body, but the, but the blood is so like kind of sneaky because it's, you know, you know, it's from somebody you can't see in the picture where it's from, but you know what, what that is, you know, when you see it. So it's, it's a very striking image, so yeah. yeah. But, um, oh, yeah. but you also talked about, um, which I thought was interesting. On you were election night this year, you were not covering the election, which uh, pretty pretty amazing for anyone that's ever worked at a newspaper that they would let one of the photographers not be there for for that. You were actually uh, a couple states over covering uh, the rehabilitation of a police officer who was shot. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that project? Because that was a pretty yeah. pretty interesting project. Here. Yeah, it was uh, it was you know the first election night in at least twenty eight years that I did not cover election night, and I don't think I've ever not covered election night. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were trying to we, we've had nine officers in our area, not just in the city of St. Louis, but in our area uh, have been shot since July, mm -hmm. and uh, Blake Snyder, the one we just talked about in uh, who passed away mm -hmm. was the only fatality but among those nine we've had you know, a couple of guys get paralyzed mm -hmm. um, some with you know mine amazingly minor injuries we've had the two officers in Arnold Missouri down in the suburbs get shot in the face uh, mm -hmm. but amazingly it was buckshot and they came out of there with very minor injuries um, so it's been a variety of injuries. So the two officers that have been paralyzed, um, Michael Flamion was paralyzed at a traffic stop, um, shot in the back, or, yeah, in the neck back. Um, and uh, Craig Tudor was in a car accident when he was responding to a call for an officer needing aid. And... Um, his car was flipped upside down, and, and he's paralyzed from basically the chest down. He has movement of his arms, 
but is not able to use his hands all that well mm-hmm. at all at this point. But anyhow, they are both at Craig Hospital in in just outside of Denver mm-hmm. in rehabilitation. In fact, uh, Mike Flemion just came back to just came back to St. Louis, and um, Flemion was a really high profile story, um, possibly or mostly because the way the community, uh, the outpouring for him was just unprecedented in this area. And uh, he had not spoken to media yet. And uh, so he and his wife finally decided that they would talk to us and the tutors agreed to talk to us. And it just happened to be the day they agreed to talk to us was election day. And so we had to go with their schedule. Mm -hmm. And so we went out there and we spent a couple of days at the hospital and, I think I've told people before it was it was really surreal being in the hospital on election day and not hearing anybody talk about candidates, not mm. watch anybody watching any of this on television. Uh, you know, the, the folks who are in that hospital, it's, uh, it's it's for spinal cord injuries and traumatic brain injuries, and they are in there to recover, and they are very focused and. You know, they, they have a certain schedule, and they don't miss their schedule, and they are just they are just trying to get better, or at least get some handle on on their new normal in their lives. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so it was an amazing time to be there with them, just because of everything politically that was swirling around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that allowed you to be, you know, everyone to be, I'm sure this is by design, like you said, to, to just be present and work on getting these guys better. So I think that, you know, had to be quite kind of a, you know, different experience from the wall to wall coverage that the rest of us were, were enduring. So, um, yeah, yeah. You know, I did. I mean, late into the evening, you know, a reporter and I went back to our hotel and, and we did watch, you know, we did watch uh-huh. the turns late into the evening and, uh, we were surprised as very many people were surprised mm-hmm. but, uh, but it was amazing how focused they were yeah. in the hospital for sure um, now I liked what you had to say about this because you're you're talking about how you know we've had Trump saying you know the you know calling out the press uh, over and over again and uh, also you know if you want to go to the other side of the political spectrum I was just astounded by the photos you showed of the uh, it was at the Missouri University of Missouri uh, protests. Was that the one you showed? Right. Right. So those were people who were protest. You, you, would you explain that situation for people that don't know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, for for several days there was a hunger strike going on mm-hmm. by a graduate student by the name Jonathan Butler, and and there were protests going on over. Uh, People who felt that uh, that their concerns about um, violent acts toward them as students, um, specifically African American students, that their complaints hadn't been addressed by the university and the administration, and um, they felt their voice just wasn't being heard, and uh, this led to you know, this, this ratcheted up a little bit because members of the football team kind of went on strike and said, you know, they, they weren't going to practice. And, and uh, you know, they were looking at the possibility of a canceled football game and, and quite frankly, a loss, a loss in significant revenue to the, to the university and to the football mm-hmm. team. And, and um, so eventually the president, Tim Wolf, uh, resigned. And so after that happened, uh, they were willing, they had an encampment of tents and, and, and such, and, uh, they felt that they wanted to direct their own reaction to the story, and they didn't want the media there, mm-hmm. and they wanted to tell their own story. And, and the problem with all this was it's a public university, it's a public campus, mm-hmm. and, they were starting to, you know, tell media where they could go, where they could not go, who they could photograph, who they could not photograph, and that, you know that doesn't work in a public university. Right. And uh, so everywhere we went, you know, trying to get specifically, we were trying to get photographs of Jonathan Butler because he'd ended his hunger strike. He was headed to the hospital to get checked out, and later on, he was having uh, an open news conference about, you know 
what it meant to him and mm-hmm. what it meant to the supporters to uh, to have this victory and have the president step down and and uh, agree to be heard and uh, but they 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 wanted to create their own narrative and they wanted everything to come from spokespeople mm-hmm. and and it didn't go well on a public campus because when we went to try to photograph there were you know, just dozens and dozens of people, students, grad students, faculty members, uh, you know, putting hands in front of cameras. Mm-hmm. Where we went. <laughs> right. And wasn't there a journalism professor, too, that was, uh, I believe, fired because she she told people to leave, which was kind of staggering since it was a journalism yeah. professor? <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a, well, she was a, she was a communication uh, uh, systems professor who had ties to the journalism department. Uh-huh. Um, but not specifically a journalism professor. Okay. Um, but she, yeah, I mean, a very, very famous video, mm-hmm. uh, again, heavily shared video of, of, of a journalist or a student journalist, Tim Ty, a photographer, um, being accosted mm-hmm. you know, by her and another, and another, um, leader of the Greek system. And, uh, you know, I believe the quote was having, Having uh, calling for muscle to have him mm-hmm. have removed from the tent camp, and um, yeah, that didn't go over well. And you know, and I, from my end of things, I, you know, I, I photographed, I sent pictures, and I made sure that I not only sent pictures of, um, you know, what was going on with the protest and whatever photographs I could get of Jonathan Butler and and. Uh, you know, whatever celebration photographs I got, as well as uh, just what the tent camp looked like and everything. But in addition to all that, I made darn sure I also sent pictures of of the students and the faculty trying to stop us from working. And, and I made sure that I also pointed out in my tweets as I sent some of these out that, you know, this is a nationally re- renowned journalism school. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, this is what's happening today. At the University of Missouri, right, and it's it. What, the reason I brought that up, along with what Trump was saying, is because it's always interesting to me that you know you, people think of oh, this you know trying to control or, or stifle the press as being one you know political you know ideology or another, and it, but it seems like once you get further far enough on either side, it's it kind of comes around the backside, and they're they're kind of the same. It's like you know they're trying to uh, liberal conservative whatever that means these days. You know it doesn't really matter. It, it's like they want to like you said control the story, control the narrative. So it's it's definitely not just one polit- political ideology for sure. So Right, yeah. It, 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 yeah. It goes across both aisles. I yeah. wouldn't say entirely equally, but it's it, it, <laughs> I've seen it on both sides. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I also liked what you had to say about you know just getting out there and, and doing your job and kind of showing people what what you know what you do and and kind of you know just like these long term projects like you said. I mean that that do take time and and focus and a lot of your energy. But at the end of it, it, it kind of shows in the reporting. Like when you were following the people that were uh, you know being re- rehabilitated, that you know that's not something you can just drive by and do. You had to spend real time and you know get real. real relationships built to, to do that kind of work and it definitely shows in the final product so yeah exactly I mean that that's important just to you know for us just to you know keep working so little so little of the work that we do as journalists is political work mm-hmm. it's our day-to-day work as journalists whether we're newspaper or television radio whatever um, it's not political mm-hmm. it, you know it's stories about real people living their real real lives and and having real challenges and mm-hmm. and we need to you know we need to keep doing that and we need to make sure that people see that and maybe you know really maybe start you know doing things that we haven't done in the past a lot um, in the past we present our work and and you get letters to the editor or reader comments online um you know just trashing this trashing that and a lot of times we just kind of, you know, let that go and let that slide. Mm-hmm. And I think we're at the point now that we need to start 
answering that criticism and right. making people understand what we do a little bit clearer. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, you know, there's there's all this, you know, talk now of being post-fact, you know, and also, like, you know, we are in you know, this fake news sea or whatever, but I, re- I really do think that, yeah, you can't let some of that stuff go. You really do have to address it. And my, my first, you know, impulse is to just block, mute, just hide, you know, get, get this out of here. But, you know, that doesn't make it go away, you know, and there's people out there that are going to think what they're going to think. But if you don't address it, they're going to assume that you, you know, agree with it or that that's you know actually the way it is so yeah i've I've had kind of a a tricky dance with especially you know i guess i go i do most of my you know commentary or or whatever on on twitter and Mm -hmm. and, um i really try you know from the get-go i try not to block anything or, or you know let people have their say um I think I can only think of two or three instances where I had to block somebody because I felt that maybe they're getting threatening and and kind of taking things over the line. Mm-hmm. But generally, you know, if they're gonna if they're gonna criticize us heavily, uh, let them do it and you know answer the questions wherever we can answer questions mm-hmm. and um, and go from there. I I had a had an exchange with a guy over the weekend. It was actually right after I left the conference. Uh, that uh, apparently at the Wisconsin game, after the game, uh, the players, you know, Wisconsin lost, and and the players were trying to stop photographers that were on the field mm. taking pictures of the dejection of the of the Wisconsin players, and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, one of the photographers tweeted something out about that, and you know, I I, I hopped on and said, you know, that's unacceptable, and, mm-hmm. and he had some. Then you had some Badgers boosters get on and say, no, you know, the media is unacceptable and perfectly legitimate. And, you know, I, I got back on. It's like, you know, you can't, can't have it both ways. You can't, we can't cover victories and not cover defeats. Right. Tell the story. We tell the story of the day, whatever that story is. And so we went back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I tried to explain the role of the media a little bit clearer and I, you know, I tried. I don't know if it or not. <laughs> That's all you can he did, do. However, yeah, he, ever, he did, however, follow me. So <laughs> maybe he'll pay attention. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe I'll get somewhere with some tweet that will resonate with him. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I think you're right about that. And I feel like I think a lot of the problem is there's a real lack of media literacy. Like, people don't know how to read a newspaper, apparently. Like, I'll write, a, you know, an opinion column and then put it up on, on the paper's Facebook page. And people are like, oh, totally biased. It's like, well, you know, it did appear on the opinion page. So so it's like this is my opinion. So this is not you know straight news coverage, and I wish people could you know figure out the difference between the two. And like you said, there's just some things that people need to understand about how the press works that apparently people don't. And I guess it's just an ongoing education that we have to do. So. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's all we can do is just keep keep talking with them. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, what uh, what would your advice be to people that want to get into photography that seem you know a little intimidated by the amount of equipment that that you have to get, and how would you recommend people start if they're interested? It depends on, you know, there's so many different roads to go down. Um, you know, deciding to be a newspaper photojournalist in, in this era of declining readership and mm-hmm. ad revenue and everything else and layoffs, layoffs, layoffs is a very bold thing if you actually still want to do that. And, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, you start out with a good education and then in some field, um, but you know, all kinds of photographs are made by all kinds of equipment. Mm-hmm. And you know, I had a there's a guy I'm talking to on Twitter now who's kind of just starting out, and you know, he bought he found a deal on a, on a camera and lens for like three hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and, and it's going to be a good starter for him. And and uh, you know, you can you can make great photographs with little equipment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you really only start getting into the heavy investments when you either need, you know, really specialty lenses or if you are, you know, you know, working photographer that, that runs a, a tremendous amount of frames on your camera and, you know, you need like a workhorse, that's when you actually start needing to spend money in those two situations. Mm-hmm. But generally, any, you know, any camera uh, is going to make nice photographs. And mm-hmm. so, um, there's so many, I mean, there's so many different things people do now and it's not, 
certainly not just journalism. In fact, the, the, you know, journalism is few and far between. I mean, there's all kinds of, all kinds of opportunities out there. It's just a matter of what, you know, what do you like to photograph? Mm-hmm. Architecture photographers out there that, you know, never really deal with people. They deal with buildings and, and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, avenues of portraits, of weddings, of mm-hmm. products. You name it, it's out there. So, right. but newspapers and journalism, I, you know, I think anybody getting into that right now is a real special breed, unlike <laughs> it was when I got into it in the eighties. Right. There were there were a lot of jobs in the eighties, mm-hmm. and there are not so much in two thousand sixteen. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think I think some of us are, you know, and I'm sure that you feel the same way. It's like you're, it's almost beyond you. It, I feel it's like a calling for me in in some ways. You know, it kind of has to be because it's like, like you said, it's it's never really been tougher. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, no job security and you, know, mm-hmm. you, you, you do what you do because you love what you do. Right? Yeah. And as long as they keep telling you to do it every day when you go to work, then that's yeah. good. Exactly. Well, um, we're getting close to the hour mark here, and I, I do appreciate you taking the time. But we always talk about music uh, at the end to kind of wrap it up. So what music have you been listening to lately? Oh, man. Uh, I am like the wrong person to do that. <laughs> music. So this is, this is what I was listening to yesterday. Okay. Yesterday, I was doing some editing for a friend of mine. I just shot some senior pictures of her of her son and I was listening to uh, James Taylor and Carol King mm. doing live from the Troubadour nice. I believe that was a it's not that far, it's not that old it's like 2011 2012 they mm. got together to do this and it's just man it's just a tremendous concert cool uh, so that's that's what I was listening to <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, I like I said, I really appreciate it, and I, I do look up to you. And you were like, uh, told me on Twitter that you're not that interesting, but that is kind of why I, I admire you because you you put the work in, and and you this is the result of it. Just keeping your nose to the grindstone and and doing your thing for long enough that you know it it kind of gets that wider attention, rightly. So I I do appreciate the you know work that you put in and the perseverance and all that. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, is there any Anything else I didn't ask you about that that you wanted to get in there before we go? I don't think so. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. I, again, I really appreciate it, and uh, thanks so much. Okay. Have a great day, yeah. and uh, I'll I'll hear this when you're ready. Yeah, for sure. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.